I don't know if there's anyone here who's in a job that doesn't feel great for them, but you might be experiencing some of the things I did. I not only felt exhausted, but I had, you know, crazy things happening. Like I would get hives all over my body. I once passed out face first on a concrete subway platform. So things got pretty bad for me as I was in this position trying to power through this career that felt bad. Welcome and hello everyone. My name is Katya Panzar. I'm a writer and journalist based in Helsinki, Finland. I grew up in Vancouver and lived in Toronto for many years. One of my areas of focus is Sisu, a unique form of fortitude in the face of challenges, big and small. My first book on the topic, the Finnish way has been translated into 22 different languages around the world. My follow-up book, Everyday Sisu, Tapping into Finnish Fortitude for a Happier and More Resilient Life, will be published next week by Penguin Random House in New York. One of Everyday Sisu's main messages is that the happiest way forward is together. Whether we're looking to improve our well being at work, tackle big picture issues such as climate crisis or homelessness. Finland has, of course, been named the world's happiest country by the UN for four years in a row. I will be moderating today's discussion, which is part of the Nordic Talks presented by the Harbor Front Center. I'd like to start by asking each of our panelists to provide a short self-introduction, followed by their response to the following provocation. How, briefly, do you define happiness at work? Let's start with Maya. Uh, it's great to be here, and this is a definitely unique opportunity to kind of enter back into the world in person, but still be remote. Uh, and I think a lot about how that actually contributes to what I consider to be uh, a form of happiness. Uh, so I'll start with my intro. I was born with a disability. I've used a wheelchair throughout my life. And, you know, I've constantly just navigated a world that really hasn't been built with me in mind. You know, I, I that was really one of the things that motivated me to solve my own problem, to figure out a way to create a digital platform that could connect people with accessibility information to live more independent and meaningful lives. And I think that adds to a lot of what makes me happy, the freedom of choice, the ability to make decisions based on access and independence, and I think a lot about, you know, the world that we live in now and having the opportunity to be beamed into an event like tonight, that element of equity and inclusion, I think, of being accessible in all kinds of ways is really a, a very fulfilling concept for me. So I think that that adds a lot to how I define happiness. Wonderful. Thank you. And over to Linus. Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to be here. Uh, for me, uh, the whole journey or the whole issue about happiness started some years ago when I found myself in a situation where uh, I wasn't happy uh, at my workplace, in my own company. Um, I was uh, exhausted. I was um, uh, working overtime and I started to realize that or I had, had a huge problems balancing uh, work and life. Uh, and I started to notice that a lot of, uh, all, almost all of my employees were in the same situation. Um, and this is something that's quite uh, predominant in the, in the computer games industry. Uh, it's sort of standard that you put in a lot of extra time, you, you do crunches in your overtime, and, and, and uh, a lot of people get exhausted and, and are basically not happy. Uh, in a business where it's supposed to be a very creative and fun place to work at. 
So, um, so I, I've decided to do an experiment uh, uh, with my team and I asked, asked them if, what would you think about doing an experiment where we have, like, we work in tens and focus for three hours and then we have a lunch break uh, for an hour and then we work an additional three hours and then we go home. Can, what, what, can we, what can we learn from that? What would change? Uh, we wouldn't change any salary or perks or anything like that. So it was actually quite easy sell to the, co to the, uh, to the employers. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so we, we started, uh, started doing that uh, experiment. And it was really, uh, we took a lot of uh, interesting um, uh, results from that. Uh, it was originally, my intention was to have an experiment for like a couple of months. But we just kept going with that uh, principle for for uh, for years uh, after that. Uh, but the the most uh, interesting result was the fact that um, people left work uh, not being fatigued. They were they were sort of happy to leave work and they were happy to come back the next day. Uh, and so I, I I almost instantly saw the effect of people. Um, becoming more happy. That was, that was like the most important um, uh, thing that happened. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to discuss other things uh, later, but, but it, 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 it was amazing to see how quickly people went from being very tired into to be more, more of a happy, uh, happy workplace, creating better creativity and, and, and better, um, better products. And a fun little anecdote around that was that <clears throat> uh, an American magazine, I think it was Fast Company, they picked this up and they, they wanted to interview me about this. And I told them about the experiment. I told them about the results. Uh, and they you know, printed an article. But the person responsible for the headline said that um, Sweden is now moving into six-hour workday. <laughs> and, and then the whole internet exploded. Uh, like everybody was like, oh, this is amazing uh, that Sweden is taking such a leap. Uh, and I was like, oh, it's, it's only us. Um, uh, and, and then a lot of Swedes broad started to say that, you know, this is not true. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's great. And shall we hand it over to Sarah? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Sarah Vermont and I'm the founder of a company called Careergasm, um, which is all about feel good work, hence the name. And I, you know, I have a story kind of similar to Linus's actually in that I was once in a career that felt pretty bad for me. I was really worn out. I used to be a business professor of organizational behavior. So workplace psychology, um, ironically, studying a bunch of stuff about workplace happiness. And the further I got into that career path, I realized, good Lord, I am not a researcher. I am not a scientist. And I found that uh, for those of you who don't know, about 80% of a professor's job is research, conducting research, and only about 20% is teaching. So I loved the 20% of my job, and I was really worn out by the 80%. It just didn't fit me. So for a couple of years, I tried to power through, as people often do at the beginning when they're in careers that feel bad, we try to power through. Um, and that didn't work so well for me. I don't know if there's anyone here who's in a job that doesn't feel great for them, but you might be experiencing some of the things I did. Um, I felt exhausted all the time. You know a little bit about that. I not only felt exhausted, but I had, you know, crazy things happening like hives unexpectedly. I would get hives all over my body. I once passed out face first on a concrete subway platform. So things got pretty bad for me as I was in this position trying to power through this career that felt bad. And one day, uh, fortunately, I mean, it was very embarrassing, but fortunately, I had a breakdown in the middle of a crowded Starbucks. And the next day I gave notice and decided to pursue a different career path, actually helping other people make career changes instead of just researching workplace happiness. And so I have a ton of empathy for the people I work with because I know what it's actually like to feel stuck in a job that feels bad and to feel like there is no other path and to feel trapped. Um, and so workplace happiness for me, you know, doing this work, helping people make career changes for the past 10 years or so, I found there's a few things that are really important to people. Um, I would say one of the biggest things is being able to actually use your gifts 
in the world. And those gifts are different for every individual, right? And so as you evolve and grow, the things you enjoy and are good at might change and evolve too, which is why maybe something that once made you happy perhaps no longer makes you happy after a certain point in time. And we'll talk a little bit more later on about the importance of like different career ingredients for different individuals. But I find it so important for people to be able to identify what their gifts are, what they actually enjoy, and be able to flex that a little bit at work. Um, that's certainly been my experience. So that's, that's a big part of workplace happiness for me. Thank you, Sarah. That was wonderful. And thank you. All of our panelists gave great answers. I think it's very interesting how most people find happiness through experiencing unhappiness and having challenges and difficulties that lead them to their path. So now what we're going to do is move towards examining the role of passion and purpose in job satisfaction. So building on our theme, does doing meaningful work impact your level of happiness at work. And I'd like to address this first to Mayan, who is an activist for accessibility. I, I think definitely. Uh, you know, for me, I've kind of alluded to it before, but I've always kind of felt like I didn't really fit the mold. You know, like I was navigating a world that wasn't accessible trying to somehow fit this mold, a world that was designed for somebody else. And I think that when I started kind of embracing the fact that actually the world could use some changing and, and it wasn't just up to me to kind of squish myself into this, what I consider now broken model, I, I started recognizing what my true passion and, and kind of purpose was. And, and for me, it really kind of boiled down to advocacy. You know, how can I start to help people understand that, you know, a curb cut is a great thing and that everybody could benefit from it. Or that when we invest in accessibility, we can kind of expand our doorways quite literally to more diverse and inclusive experiences for people. And just by showing up time and being myself, I kind of found that that motivated me to kind of follow that. And, you know, I, I started my career as a photographer and I loved meeting images. I loved meeting people. I found that part of the work was, that was most enjoyable to me anyway, was the ability to like change my mind. You know, they'd see me, and they'd say, there's no way she's our there's no way that this girl sitting on a wheelchair is going to take the going to be, you know, on the magazine or on the cover of the book. And it helped me strengthen this, you know, this path that I had to meet people where they started education and by the end of it, where I wanted them to. And that really let me kind of follow that purpose, that, that kind of ambition to change people's mind about, you know, the role of disability plays in our, our world and how we can create inclusive experience for everyone reach their potential. So I think, you know, my happiness has really been about following my own path, being entrepreneurial, kind of actually being a voice. Uh, and that just brought so much satisfaction to me because I was really good at it. So I totally echo Sarah's point about finding something you're good at and then finding meaning from it. Yeah. And that's an excellent example of being the change that you want to see, I would say. Now, moving from the meaning of work to the shape and structure of your job, so how much time you spend working each day directly impacts your well-being and your sense of contentment. So for example, uh, the typical working model for the Monday to Friday, nine to five work schedule means that approximately one third of your day is spent working 
uh, one third is for free time and one third is for sleep. Linus, as an employer who has implemented initiatives, including the six hour work day, which I understand you revolutionized all of Sweden with, is this one third, one third, one third formula ideal for productivity or not? Well, that is a very interesting question, but we, I think that we have to talk a little bit about productivity uh, because what, what we noticed uh, in the experiment is that or I think there's a general conception, a wrong conception of the fact that we, if, we, if we work six hours instead of eight hours, we're less productive or we don't have time to do uh, uh, as much work. But we saw that, that you could easily do the same amount of work in six hours than you do in eight hours. I think that we all can feel that when we're at work at eight hours, we, we're not super focused on, on uh, exactly what we should do. We do other things in order to break the, the mon monotony or, or f f not getting tired uh, because it is exhausting even uh, you know, even if you sit in front of a computer, it's an exhausting uh, kind of work. So what we saw was that going down to six hour workday, we could sort of re remove a lot of fudge time or, or time spent in, in other things. So we maintain the same productivity. This is not the same as that we increased productivity. We just took away a lot of dead weight. And also we spent a lot of time in unnecessary meetings, etc. So, so, um, so Talking about that or having that in mind, I think that we are seeing, I'm, I'm hoping that we're seeing a paradigm shift in companies that are not focused or that doesn't believe that, that if we just uh, treat our, our employees as resources, uh, you know, if, and, and we just push them harder, they're going to be more productive. I think that uh, creating a workplace where people can be more focused, but also have more time for 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 life is uh, is something that will in the end gain the company more than than just profitability. So so um, so I think that that whole concept is going to change, uh, and and I think that uh, or we saw we did a study after the experiment and and uh, uh, or during the experiment and where we tried to measure um, the importance of of salary or pay versus time uh, and we we saw um, we saw that there's a there's a change of opinion when it comes to that that status is not as important uh, in terms of of having a higher salary or having a higher career, people start to um, acknowledge that time is is a very valuable thing. Um, so, so for me, it was it was obvious that, that I mean, those two hours, uh, those extra two hours, uh, was the world of difference uh, for for almost almost everyone at the workplace. It didn't fit all. Uh, it's like you said. I mean, some people have. Uh, we, we had a, uh, a young programmer, for example, he was just, you know, I'm just going to work six hours. I'm, I'm ready to work 12 hours. What am I going to do with my, the rest <laughs> of my, my time? Uh, so we, we, we saw that, you know, for some people, it, it, it just didn't work. Uh, and also we could see that there's a, we have two different types of, mainly two different types of, of um, uh, people working in the industry, we have the programmers and we have the graphic artists. The programmers, they have a very uh, non-linear kind of task or work. And, and for them, they increased their productivity uh, because they were not as tired uh, doing their work. But for the graphic artists, they have usually quite linear uh, kind of production. They could see uh, uh, that they sort of degraded in productivity. They, could, they didn't have an, any, uh, as much time to do all the things that they needed to do. So it, there was some in interesting findings when it comes to productivity. Um, however, and this is one, one thing that I found very important, is, is that if you're going to deal with um, time, um, I mean, if a, a big problem with the structure is that 
if you compensate for those extra hours with money, then you create uh, a workplace where you have competition uh, in the sense that, you know, if someone decides that I'm just going to work six hours and the rest of the crew is going to work eight hours, then that's going to be frowned upon. People are going to think that you're, you're abandoning a team, you're not putting, you know, the same, you know, uh, what do you say, carrying the same weight as we do. So it's very important not to compensate people that decides to work longer with pay. And so we created this, um, this exchange system that if you put in extra hours, you will take those hours and have an extended leave or something like that. Again, and for reinforcing the, the concept of time. Um, and this was something that we found very useful for those energetic programmer that suddenly, you know, I can take an extra week off. And they were like, yes, that's exactly what you can do. And then, you know, um, yeah, it was all good. Yeah. Did I answer the question? I don't know. But uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's a different take on productivity. Um, I think that we have to change, uh, change our, mind, our mindset when it comes to that. Now, Sarah, you help people leave work that they don't like and tap into fulfillment, happiness, and well-being by finding the right job. So many of us are familiar with this saying, choose a job that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Do you think that statement is true or false? Uh, you know, as, as someone who's the founder of a company called Careergasm, uh, people often assume that I would say yes to that question. Like, sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> um, However, I don't think it's realistic. I mean, I love my job and there are still days where it still feels like work, certainly, right? Um, what I think feels more true than sort of the, the binary, work will feel good if it's something you're passionate or it will feel bad if it's something you don't love, that sort of binary thinking. I think what, what feels more true and accurate to me and the people I work with is, I think your relationship to your work should feel uh, very much like the relationships you have in the rest of your life in that it should feel good most of the time. So if you think of the relationship you have with perhaps a partner or the relationships you have with friends and family members, hopefully those relationships are feeling good most of the time, right? But there are always times that stretch us, right? Those growth moments uh, where we can sort of like make a couple of changes, have some conversations that need to be had, and then things improve. Um, but then, of course, there are times where it's just not working anymore. Maybe you've outgrown each other and a change is needed. And so I think thinking of work, uh, you know, ourselves and our relationship to work as being something that should feel good most of the time is probably uh, a better, more realistic way to think about work. Great answer. Thank you. I'd like to ask another question from a Nordic perspective because we know that societal structures help facilitate happiness at work. So how much do you think the Nordic model with universal daycare, for example, contribute to equality? And why is gender equality in the workplace important for happiness? Yes, this is, this is a very interesting topic and this is something that's really close to my heart because I, uh, I have, been fortunate, or maybe I control that in a sense that I've uh, been very rare as a company, as a game industry company, that we almost all all of the years uh, in, in um, uh, when when the companies existed, we have had a 50-50 uh, percentage of of females and males. Uh, this is mainly due to the fact that we're doing games that are more family oriented instead of you know like the regular war games. Uh, but but in general, the games industry is very very male dominated. But so there's 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 this issue about universal daycare could probably easen up the decision of like who is going to work full time. Uh, it's going to be. I mean, we are living in that reality that it's mostly the men that. I mean, it's not only in the game industry, but it's I think it's predominant in, in other industries as well. Uh, because men have higher salary, uh, so so the decision all uh, very often falls on on the female, the woman, the mother staying at home, taking care of 
or, or handling the, the, um, yeah, the, the dropping off and picking up kids. So what we noticed when we went to six hour workday, uh, then there was more flexibility in, in um, uh, trying out different variations in that sense. So, so I, th I think it is a very interesting model. When it, I think it would open up for more um, uh, female integration. Sorry, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds so weird. But I think that you understand what I'm saying is that it, mm -hmm. it, if you have more flexibility in, 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 in making that decision, who is going to do this and who's going to do what. So a healthy work-life balance also means inclusivity and accessibility. So I would like to ask Mayan a question. Um, current workplace models unfortunately ignore a large percentage of the population According to the World Health Organization, 15% of the world's population, that's an estimated 1.1 billion people, identify as having some form of disability. So this represents the world's largest minority. And I would like to ask, uh, because in Canada, according to the statistics, more people with disabilities are underemployed so what can employers do to welcome and enable disabled employees? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a complex issue because it takes uh, having some uncomfortable conversations often in the beginning. And, you know, part of my work as founder of Access Now, it, it started with me just trying to solve my own problem. And along the way, I was invited to engage with employers with large companies that wanted to understand, you know, what when you talk about accessibility, how do we incorporate that into the workplace? How can we create greater senses of inclusion? And, and also, you know, what's this whole thing about representation? And I think, you know, there's this, there's really two models, there's two schools of thought uh, when it comes to any disability issue. You can look at uh, kind of what's called the medical model, which is this concept that there's a person with a disability and that person needs fixing. That person needs uh, medicine, uh, equipment, health care. Um, and, and we should do all of these things to help that person uh, be less disabled. Uh, and there's another model, which is the social model, of disability. And, and in the social model, it says that there's actually nothing inherently broken uh, about the person who has a disability, but really it's about the environment surrounding that person that needs the fixing. So, you know, we look at the built environment and we think, well, we built steps, but if we created a ramp in that space, you know, we would allow many more people to engage. Uh, and all of a sudden there's no issue. There's no reason for someone to not be able to access the space. And that's in the built environment. But what about in the workplace? What about people who are looking for jobs that are, you know, considered, uh, you know, less productive? Or mm, I'm not sure if maybe this person would require too much accommodation. Or well, we don't really have disabled people here, or our space isn't accessible. And there are a million reasons why I've heard that, you know, hiring people with disabilities is difficult to do. And yet we look at the labor market and we look at shortages and I think, well, there's a really weird mismatch happening here because what I know is that my disability personally has contributed to my resilience and my creativity, my ability to think outside the box and you know to be agile and to show up, let's say again, at an entrance that's not accessible and find 15 other ways to still get to the event or engage with the person I want to or do the thing that I'm trying to achieve. And I think those lessons of what disability can offer our workplaces and what disability can teach us about creating more accessible, inclusive products, experiences, services, I think that's the missed opportunity that I really like to connect employers to that it's, it shouldn't be about a handout, you know, oh, it would be nice if we could include people, but really about, you know, this competitive advantage often that you're missing out on when you don't 
uh, invest in diversity of all kinds. So hopefully that answers your question, but happy to share more. I think that's a great answer because it's about flipping the the idea. You know, people are missing out on an opportunity and that there's so much more. It's beneficial for everybody. And uh, it's really about re-examining what people think might be a challenge and realizing that it's actually a strength and something that brings resilience. Um, very, very good answer. And Wonderful to have um, such great experts on our panel because we have such different backgrounds and everyone is bringing, you know, really good information and expertise to our conversation. Uh, but what we're going to do now is we're going to move into an audience question. Um, here it is. Do you think that happiness at work is easier to achieve now that organizations have more experience with hybrid workplace models? Who would like to answer that question? I can tackle that one first. That would be Katya. great, Sarah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's tricky because I think a lot of, you know, while we have access to hybrid work models, I feel like it's still largely an experiment. Um, and, you know, we're finding that a lot of, not everybody wants the same thing. Um, and so, you know, on the surface, that, that means that, like, of course, it seems great, that we have these hybrid models so that, you know, people can be at work sometimes in the actual workspace, be working at home other times. I think the piece, and I do think overall that's going to contribute to more uh, flexibility and autonomy, which is really important, at least to a lot of the people I work with. So that's, that's a big old checkbox for happiness at work for a lot of people. The part I feel like um, is still a bit tricky is it's also, you know, a lot of people really care about connection at work. And I think hybrid models make that a little bit trickier. You know, if we're all online in one place, we can connect a certain way. If we're all in one physical space, we can connect a certain way. And I feel like a lot of organizations are still working out the kinks for how to do those hybrid models in terms of connection. So I think once we work that out a little bit more, uh, I think once we get that connection piece, it'll be even better for people. Wonderful. Thank you. We have one uh, final question from the audience before we go to our wrap up. Uh, what is the most important first step a person should take toward finding work happiness? And I think this is something that um, we could ask all of our panelists to very briefly answer. Could we start with Mayan? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, you know, I think for me, the one step that I would take is, is it, and I think it's kind of come up throughout the, the whole event, is like finding that sense of purpose and, and letting that guide you. And, you know, for some people, you know, workplace happiness is about making a lot of money and that's their purpose is to make a lot of, like, and that could be okay. Uh, you know, and to, to Linus's point, like sometimes it's about time and, and having that time back. Uh, and I think for me, you know, it, I didn't really have a choice about figuring out like who I was as a person pretty, pretty young. I was like, oh, okay, I, I got to do things a bit differently. Um, and while I watched my kind of my friends and my, my siblings kind of grow up around me and try to figure out like, what, who am I in the world and what do I want? I think that the one kind of gift that I was given was that I kind of figured that out early. Uh, and I think that the second you find that passion and that that purpose that drives you, uh, and definitely with within the world of entrepreneurship, like that's the that's the name of the game. Uh, it just makes a world of difference and and adds completely to to like a life more fulfilled. So I think that would be what I would offer as a closing remark. Excellent. And how about Linus? Um, I think that if you as an employee wait for the company to sort of adjust themselves, it's going to take time because, again, they want to be very, very profitable. I think that what you should demand uh, is, is to sort of break out of your silo. This is... This is what I'm here. This is where, where I'm, I'm put here to do this. Uh, um, I think that you sh that is one one very important step 
to take ownership of not only what you're doing, but also what the whole company is doing to sort of to sort of demand that you should be a part of or understanding the whole of the company. Uh, also, the matter of inclusion, um, it's, you know, every, almost every company today have sort of an inclusion plan, but it, it, it's, it's not, it's, we don't see that that's totally working. So I think that um, knowing that you can, that you have, a, that you have, uh, that you should have a place in the workplace uh, if, um, is, is something that I would strongly advise to, to, to sort of own that space. Um, yeah. Excellent. And Sarah? Yeah, as a first step, um, you know, I work with a lot of people who are desperate to get out of their jobs because they've they've been unhappy for a while. And so what I always encourage my clients to do as a first step is to, <laughs> to sort of... Uh, stop the like job search doom scrolling because it's like the first thing you want to do when you get out of that job is like you check the job postings right and the trouble with that is it's great if you know what you're looking for if you don't know what you're looking for it's kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack but like without even knowing what a needle looks like so um, I think it's really important to get clarity about what matters to you first I have all of my clients like the very first time we meet I have them create what I call a hissy fit list and a squeals of delight list. And I have them write down what I call all the career ingredients of the stuff that drives them crazy that they would love to leave in their dust and not bring into the next phase of their career. And I have them really like itemize in a really granular and specific way the ingredients of the things that they do want, maybe some things they want to keep about their work, some other things they want to add to their work. And when you're working with a collection of ingredients, all of a sudden you can start to see things take a different shape. And that's a lot more empowering as a first step. Excellent. I would just love to thank all of our excellent panelists and our audience today. Thank you so much. And we're so happy that everyone was able to join us. And I wish you all the best. And I hope that you stay safe. From the rugged Arctic landscape where reindeer roam and the sky dances with northern lights, to the hustle and bustle of urban city centers where lights move people. The energy all around us informs the art The ideas, our culture, and our life. Nordic Bridges, a year-long celebration throughout Canada of art, culture, and ideas from across the Nordic region. Nordic Bridges 2022, contemporary art culture, led by Harbourfront Centre working with cultural partners all across Canada, supported by the Nordic Council of Ministers. Learn more at nordicbridges.ca. We need to talk. Time is flying. But we can still make a difference. As human beings, we need inspiration and we need to work together across the globe. Are you ready? Nordic Talks brings together thinkers and doers from around the world in curious conversations. Nordic Talks is all about rethinking how we overcome our global challenges together and how we hand over a sustainable world to future generations without losing focus on the important things. Let's talk. Nordic Talks is a monthly talk series with live panels starting in January. Visit harborfrontcenter.com for more information.